Well, good morning, everyone. It's a pleasure to be here with you for this chapel program. Thank you for the special. I really enjoyed that. It's my privilege to be back and be teaching here this last week, and I enjoyed getting to know some new students and uh, getting to know some of you. Uh, you, might, you may not know uh, my background or uh, what I do. My name is Bruce Martin. Uh, I am the second generation missionary. My father, Milton Martin, began work in Mexico in 1961. When we moved to Mexico, I was four years old, so I grew up on the mission field. I have a wonderful heritage. My great-grandfather was a Baptist preacher. My grandfather was never a pastor, but he was involved very much as a lay preacher. And my father, and I'm the fourth generation of my family, I have a son who's a missionary in Argentina. So he's the fifth generation in my family. So I have a wonderful legacy. I thank the Lord for that. Uh, I accepted the Lord Jesus as my Savior when I was eight years old. And when I was 12, I felt the call of, the God, of God upon my life to serve him. I um, went to college at Bob Jones University. And my degree was in cinema. And I worked three years on the film called Sheffy. I had got a lot of, a lot of experiences I could tell you about that. I went into that knowing I was going to be a missionary because I looked at it as, well, is this a way that I can acquire communication skills to share the gospel better? That was my goal. After, since then, uh, I met my wife there at the, at the college. She was born in Puerto Rico and grew up in Venezuela, not a missionary kid. Her father worked for Exxon. She got saved when she came back to the States to go to a boarding school, and then she went to the same college I went to, and she was a ma her major was Spanish, and then she got a degree, and master's degree in Spanish, taught for two years in high school before we were married. So both of us were bilingual, bicultural all of our lives. God allowed us to become members of Metropolitan Baptist Church in 1980, and they're in Fort Worth, Texas, and they sent us out as missionaries. Last year, our church celebrated its 100th anniversary. I have a wonderful legacy that the Lord has allowed us to be working with that church now for 40, almost 45 years and uh, doing a lot of stuff. I went to Mexico to work with my father for the first part of my missionary ministry. Then in 1987, we moved to Honduras, Central America, and I worked there for 17 years as missionary. And since 2004, I've been working all over Latin America. Uh, we moved our home to Fort Worth, Texas, but from there, I travel. I probably travel over 100,000 miles a year just in airlines. And uh, I do a lot of stuff in Cuba. I make two or three trips a year to that country. Uh, other countries, like Mexico, I've already made three trips this year. And I'll be going back this, a week from tomorrow. I'll be going back to Mexico for a conference. I do a lot of other areas of the, uh, the world. Mainly what I do is what I do this week. I go to those air, different countries and spend a week or two training pastors and uh, getting uh, involved in the, in the training of workers and helping missionaries and other um, ministries to develop their, their leadership. For instance, in May, the first week of May, I'll be in Colombia for two weeks uh, teaching at a, at a Bible school there. Uh, I've got a full schedule already this year, but it's been a privilege to be here with you this week and to share some things. I, our, our church also has a college. It's called Texas Theological University, and I work in that school too, do a lot of teaching there. We have uh, that school is the extension uh, in, in Latin America in Spanish. And we online have about 50 students that I do most of that teaching. We have uh, my brother-in-law, David Lott, who's a missionary in Peru, and his son, Jonathan Lott, are also teachers. And we have several others that teach in the Spanish division. And so that really is an area that I'm developing a lot right now. So I'm involved heavily in, in the teaching ministry. And for me, it's a pleasure that God has allowed me to do that. I will be here tomorrow and uh, preaching on the, on the subject of missions. In fact, during Sunday school, we'll be talking about the, the, the importance of training men on the mission field and the indigenous principle. But this morning, I would like for you to open your Bibles to 1 John chapter 1 and verse 9. We're going to read a verse that you know very well. And I'm going to preach a thematic message on the subject of confession, the confession of sin. It's a very broad subject. We can spend a lot of time, so I'm going to look at it from a unique angle, I trust, and it will help you to understand what confession truly is. I feel that our biggest problem is we don't really understand 
what the term confession means. We have a lot of idea, we think of it, but sometimes we do things thinking they're a confession and they're not. And my goal this morning is to make you understand and help you see what godly confession, what true confession really is. 1 John 1, 9 says, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. This is a promise. God has promised us that he will forgive us if we confess. So this is the linchpin. This is a very key verse in that area. We believe it. Now, confession can be involved in several different areas, not just confession to God. Of course, we hear this is confessing to God. I call this a vertical confession because we're going up to heaven. But in the book of James, chapter 5, we also find what I call horizontal confession. James, chapter 5, and verse 16, James 5, 16 and here we find that we shouldn't just confess to God, but we should confess one to another. James 5, 16, confess your faults one to another and pray for another that ye may be healed. The effectual fervent prayer of a righteous man availeth much. Now, horizontal confession means that we must confess to those that we've offended. When we sin, we yes, of course, sinning is against God. Every sin is against God. That's why we have to confess to him. But sin also affects our fellow man. Most sins that we commit will hurt others. And when we hurt others, we offend others, we have the responsibility also to ask forgiveness of them. But what is, forgi- what is, what is confession? What is asking for forgiveness? Well, there's a lot of ways that we do that that I don't like. For instance, we will say a lot, I'm sorry. I hate that. It's not of the right way to ask for forgiveness. Because I'm sorry just says, I feel bad for what happened. You're not really saying I was wrong. You're just saying I'm feeling bad. Well, I feel bad that I didn't have breakfast this morning. It doesn't really mean anything. Or, this is another way I've seen this happen a lot. There's something between us. We've got something wrong between us. I don't know what it is. If I did something wrong, please forgive me. That's not confession either. What you're saying is, I don't recognize I've done anything wrong, but maybe you think I have done something wrong, and I'm the better person, so I'm going to try to make it right. That's not really confession. Or, we were both wrong. Please forgive me for my part. What are you doing there? You're trying to accuse while you're trying to confess. Because you're really saying, you did something worse than I did, but I'm the better person because I'm going to get it right. What I'd like to do this morning is I want to go through Scripture. I'm going to study instances where we see people who make apparent confessions, I'll say that, and God doesn't forgive them. Well, we just saw in 1 John 1, 9 that he promises to forgive us our sins. Is it possible that you confess and God won't forgive you? Well, look at some instances. Let's go to Exodus chapter 9. Here in Exodus chapter 9, we find the conflict between Moses and Pharaoh. Of course, Moses is trying to find, uh, to get the freedom of his nation from the slavery of Egypt. And of course, Pharaoh has hardened his heart. He's not letting them go, and because of that, God has to bring the plagues upon Egypt, the ten plagues. In this passage that we're going to read, the plague of hail has just occurred. And the hail has destroyed the land. And in Exodus chapter 9, verse 27, we find Pharaoh's confession. Let's read it. Exodus 9, 27. And Pharaoh sent and called for Moses and Aaron... And said unto them, I have sinned this time. The Lord is righteous, and I and my people are wicked. Entreat the Lord, for it is enough, that there be no more mighty thunderings and hail, and I will let you go, and ye shall stay no longer. All right, now I purposely want to take this out of context in a way. I want to look just at the confession. Because it looks really good. 
He says, Pharaoh says, I have sinned this time. The Lord is righteous, and I and my people are wicked. Now, as the leader of the nation, he does have the right to confess for the nation too. And he's saying, I have sinned, God is good, I am wicked. Looks like a really good confession. He said all the right words. But you know the story, right? What happened to Pharaoh? God killed him. Let me ask you, is Pharaoh in heaven today? No, the Bible tells us he's in hell. Why was he not forgiven? For a very important reason. He didn't repent. Now, sometimes we confuse the two things. We think repentance and confession are the same thing. They're not. Now, they're linked. And to, be a, to have a proper confession, you must have repentance. If you truly repent, you will confess. So they cannot be separated in a way, but they're not the same thing. Repentance is the attitude you have in your heart towards your sin. Confession is the action that results from that. So what is repentance? Well, we can study it in a lot of ways. Theology, we get into these aspects. We look at the word. It gives the idea you're going one direction and you turn and go a different direction entirely. You've changed what your attitude. But I have a definition that I've used that for me has been very beneficial, has really opened my eyes to understanding what true repentance is. And it's this. Repentance is when you see your sin as God sees it. I'll repeat that. Repentance is when you see your sin as God sees it. And see, the problem we have is that we always like to make our sin not as bad as it really is. We like to make it, make, give the idea that, well, yes, it's sin, but it's not really a bad sin. We like to classify sins, you know, a white lie or other things like that. But let's start, step, take a step back. What is God's attitude towards sin? Well, he hates it. He abhors it. He won't allow it in his presence. He is obligated to punish it. And when we finally get to the point, and that's what happens when we want to get saved. We finally see ourselves as God sees us. There in the place of Tyre and Sidon, when Christ made his only trip outside of the boundaries, we could say, of Israel, and he went up north, and there was a woman there that asked him to heal his, her daughter, who had had an evil spirit, and he called her a dog. And a lot of times when we read that passage, we get uncomfortable. How, that, that's really Christ being so mean, so doing that. But, you know, I think the whole key to that is looking how she responded when Christ called her a dog. She said, truth, Lord. And the reason we don't like to read that passage sometimes is we don't want to admit what she admitted to, her true condition before Christ. Do we really understand what we are? How filthy we are when we commit sin? When we finally see that, it's going to force us to confess. Now here, Pharaoh really wasn't repentant. We see that because it's actually wrong. I, I've, I've preached many times in jails. I've gone to many times in, in all over the world, many different countries. And one thing that I can guarantee you, if I go into a jail and look at the prisoners there, and I, make this, I ask them this question, if I let you out, will you live a good life? Will you stop doing what you were doing? Every single one of those prisoners will say, oh yes, if you'll let me out, I'll, I'll be a good citizen. I won't do anything bad again. And I see some of you kind of snickering and laughing. Why? Because you don't believe it, do you? When they're in jail, what will they do? They'll say anything to get out. And sometimes we do the same thing before God. We'll say anything. We'll say just like Pharaoh, I have sinned this time. I and my people are wicked. God is great. We'll say all those things. And many people in church have come forward doing those things, not because they're really in their heart believe it. They're just trying to get out of the consequences of their sin. Because that's what it really is. Sin always has consequences. 
And you might be going through consequences right now, and you're willing to say anything and do anything, not because you really see your sin as such a bad thing, but you just want to get out of the consequences. Look at another example. Forty years later in Joshua chapter 7, Moses is dead. The nation of Israel is now beginning the conquest of the land of Israel. And, of course, the first place of conquest was Jericho. Great victory. But Jericho had some certain requirements, certain standards that were required of the nation of Israel. And one of those was they could not sack, they could not loot the city. It was God's. We know that there was a man that disobeyed that. His name was Achan. And the next campaign was against Ai, and surprisingly, Israel suffered a great defeat. Over 30 men died. Joshua fell on his face before God and began to cry to the Lord, says, what's happening? And God told him, get up. I don't want you praying right now. I want you to do some action. They're sent in the camp, solve the problem. So Joshua chose a tribe, and then from that tribe, he chose a clan and then a family. And finally, he stood before Achan. In verse 19, Joshua chapter 7, verse 19, we find Achan's confession. And Joshua said unto Achan, My son, give, I pray thee, glory to the Lord God of Israel, and make confession unto him. Tell me now what thou hast done, hide it not from me. And Achan answered Joshua and said, Indeed, I have sinned against the Lord God of Israel, and thus and thus have I done. When I saw among the spoils a goodly Babylonish garment, and two hundred shekels of silver, and a wedge of gold of fifty shekels weight, then I coveted them, and took them, and behold, they are hid in the earth in the midst of my tent, and the silver under it. This is Joshua's confession. I'm sorry, Achan's, to Joshua. It looks like a very conf good confession on the surface. He's admitting that he's at fault. He's not trying to use circumstances to excuse what he did. He's not saying, well, I'm really in debt. My wife really likes the credit card and we've really got a big problem. Or we're really hungry. My family has great needs. No. He said, I saw these things and I coveted them. It's really a good example of how we should confess. He went to the root of the problem. Covetousness. When you want something that someone else has. Are we guilty of that? Let's be honest. We're guilty of how Do we confess it? We should. What happened to Achan after he did this confession? Was he forgiven? They took not only him, but his entire family outside the camp and they stoned them to death. He didn't receive forgiveness. Why? Well, very important reason. He waited too long for his confession. He waited until Joshua stood in his face, pointing his finger at him. Okay, I know you're guilty. Then Joshua demanded confession. Do you realize that there is a situations, many situations, where you can wait too long and then when you want to make confession, it doesn't work? Everyone will be resurrected doesn't matter if you're saved or unsaved. You're going to be resurrected. The question is when. We know that the rapture is when we're going to be with the Lord. But at the end of the millennium, at the great white throne of judgment, all those that are lost will be resurrected. And they will face the judgment of God at that white throne of judgment. And the Bible says all the books will be opened and all their works will be revealed. And let me ask you, will those people be willing to confess at that time? They probably will. It's all obvious. Okay, I, I'm, is it going to do any good? It's too late. You had your chance. I believe that Ananias and Sapphira, when they committed their sin of lying to the Holy Spirit and God killed them, I believe they were 
Christians, believers. God killed them and they're in heaven today. I expect to meet Ananias and Sapphira in heaven. But can you imagine their embarrassment when they got to heaven? I'm here, but not in a good way. Do you think they're willing to confess at that time? Yeah, Lord, I'm sorry I sinned to you. Yeah, you can, but it's kind of a late. How many times have I heard people talk about parents that they loved, that they did something against them, and their parent died before they had a chance to make it right? It's too late. That's the reason that when the Holy Spirit touches your heart about a sin in your life, take care of it now. Do not let the sun set on your sin. That's why when he says there in 1 John 1, 9, if we confess our sins, he's not talking to unbelievers there. The context is Christians. And there we're supposed to be confessing daily because we sin daily. Confession should be a common thing in your life. Let's look at another example. Let's go to Matthew. The book of Matthew, <coughs> chapter 27. <coughs> Of all the characters in Scripture, probably the one that is hated the most is Judas Iscariot. He's a traitor, right? He betrayed the Lord Jesus Christ. He spent three years at his feet listening to him teach. What would I have given to been in his place? And he threw it all away. But Judas confessed his sin. Let's read it. Matthew chapter 27, verse 3. Matthew 27, 3. Then Judas, which had betrayed him, when he saw that he was condemned, repented himself and brought again the 30 pieces of silver to the chief priests and elders, saying, I have sinned and that I have betrayed the innocent blood. And they said, what is that to us? See thou to that. And he cast down the piece of silver in the temple and departed and went and hanged himself. This is a very interesting confession. When we study it, it's very interesting that Judas did not try to share his guilt. He didn't say, we have sinned, even though that was true. Those chief priests were just as guilty, if not more so, than him. So he didn't say, we have sinned. He said, I have sinned. It says here also that he repented himself. Now, I'm a literalist. If the Bible says it, I accept it. So if he said he repented, I believe it. I think he did it on time. It was the very same day he committed the sin. Now, the question is, was he forgiven? Is Judas in heaven today? No. The Bible tells us he's in hell. Why? Well, some people say, well, look, he hanged himself. Well, I don't believe that. I don't believe suicide makes you lose your salvation. So what is it? Who did he confess to? He went to the chief priests and elders who were the partners in crime. If he'd gone to the cross where Christ was being crucified at that moment... With these very same words, his destiny would have been totally different. It's very important who we confess to. Now remember I talked to you at the beginning that there's vertical confession to God and there's also horizontal. Now obviously we need to confess to God and that's the point here. But there's another point here. That's the horizontal confession. You know it's hard to go to our fellow man and ask them to forgive us. Sometimes we prefer to do it in the, we'll go to our closet in private with God and we'll do it there, but we surely don't want to do it publicly. And I see in my experience that there's several ways of doing it. One of the ways that we try to get around this is substitute confession. In other words, we'll tell somebody else rather than the person we offended. If I go and talk to the pastor and I tell him everything that happened, that'll make it right. Well, the pastor cannot forgive you because you didn't offend him. Now, he can give you advice, 
He can tell you, but just telling him about it doesn't work out and solve the problem. You have to confess to the person you offended. On the other side of the coin, I've seen situations where people want to confess to everybody rather than just the person they've offended. And that's just as dangerous. God does not want your sin to be spread. He doesn't want the knowledge of your sin to be spread out. That's why he wants you to go in private with the person that you've offended and take care of it. But some people are proud. In fact, they make a big deal. I remember when I was a young person, there's a very famous movie and book called Run, Nicky, Run. It was about a young man in, in, in uh, New York City. And the Billy Graham Evangelistic Association made a big deal about this young man because he was in a gang there and he got saved and got his life right. But then he wrote a book about all his bad experiences. All the horrible things he did. And everyone just lapped it up. But wait a minute. Is that really good? I don't want to hear about the sin of someone before they got saved. I'm sure it was horrible. Now, once in a while, there is some testimony about that. But I don't want the details. That's between them and the person they offended. Now... I don't want to end on a negative note. We've seen three negatives. I give you a lot more. Let's end on a positive. Let's go to Luke chapter 15. The parable of the prodigal son. The reason I want to finish here, because this is a positive one. This is one where confession is accepted. And I want to analyze this. Of course, we know what happened. He uh, demanded his inheritance, took it off to a faraway country, and there he wasted it. And finally, when he was destitute, eating with the pigs, eating what the, what the pigs were eating. And remember, this is a story to a Jewish audience. And the Jews did not eat pork. To them, it's a very horrible meat. Uh, if, for a Jew, in his mind, if you eat pork, it's like eating a cockroach. Now think about that. Would you like to eat a cockroach? Well, that's the mind of the Jew, Okay. So here's this young man, and he's taking care of pigs, which is the, hard, the ugliest of the worst of all animals, and he wants to eat what they want to eat. In verse 17, when he came to himself, he said, How many hired servants of my father's have bread enough to spare, and I perish with hunger? I will arise and go to my father, and I will say unto him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before thee, and am no more worthy to be called thy son. Make me as one of thy hired servants." And he arose and came to his father. When he was yet a great way off, his father saw him and had compassion and ran and fell on his neck and, ble- and kissed him. And the son said unto him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and in thy sight and am no lo- more worthy to be called thy son. But the father said to his servants, Bring forth the best robe, put it on him, put a ring on his hand, shoes on his feet. Bring hither the fatted calf and kill it, and let us eat and be merry. For this my son was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found, and they began to be merry. Now, how beautiful this one is compared to the other three that we studied. Forgiveness is a great thing. But remember, our subject is confession, so let's analyze the confession of this young man. Number one, he had to take the initiative. He had to go to the father. Now, it wasn't that the father was not concerned about him. It wasn't that probably the father had not made any effort to reconcile. It says here that the father saw him a long way off. That means that what? The father was always looking. He'd gone off to a faraway country. Apparently his father was wealthy. I would bet that the father had hired people to go try to find his son. He'd lost contact with him because the son wanted nothing to do with him anymore. And the father done everything he could. Well, God has done everything he can to give us forgiveness. He sent his son to die on the cross to forgive us and give us, provide that forgiveness. He gave us the word of God so that we could know about it. He gives us preachers that will preach that message. He gives us the Holy Spirit to convict us. God has done all he can. 
And now it's up to us. We have to take that next step. The ball is in our court. Another thing, I think this is very important. He prepared his confession ahead of time. You notice how he did that? He thought ahead of time, what am I going to say? Now, we don't really appreciate our present president, right? President Biden. We don't think much of him. But let's say that on Tuesday, I have an appointment at the White House. I have a 20-minute period of time that President Biden is going to sit down and talk with me. And you say, you're going to talk to the president? What are you going to talk about? Oh, whatever comes to mind when I get there. I don't think so. I'm pretty sure I'm going to have a list of things that I'm going to talk to him about. And if you know that I'm going to talk to him, he said, would you do me a favor and tell him something on my part too? Well, that's the president of this country who's not really much compared to my God. He's much greater. And when you go before your God, what you have the chance to do at any time you want to, how do you approach it? Oh, this is whatever I feel. Well, he's my father. I can, well, yes, that's true. But do you think we should plan our prayer life? You will find that there are five essential parts to prayer, if you'll study it. There is confession of sin. There is praise to God. There is thankfulness, gratitude. There is intercession for the needs of others. And there's our own personal petitions. I'll repeat it. Confession, praise, gratitude, intercession, and our own personal petitions. Now, I use my hand to try to illustrate that because there are five parts, but I also used an order here. I started with confession and ended with our own personal petitions, but what do we do? Oh, we start out with our own thing, and at the end of our prayer, we say, oh, yes, and Lord, forgive me my sins. Well, Psalm says, if I regard iniquity in my heart, thou wilt not hear me. Why do we put confession first? It establishes that relationship. I was reading the story of Ross Perot. Now, remember, he was during the time of Clinton. He was a candidate for the presidency. He had a big company in Dallas, Texas called Electronic Data Systems. In the older days, when computers were just getting started, he got into it even before Apple and all these other things. And he had a huge multi-billion dollar company that he established. And he had business around the world. And right about the time that the revolution was going on in Iran, when the Shah of Iran was deposed and the Ayatollahs took over, he had a big contract there in Tehran to build a computer system for the government. And when the revolution occurred, his managers, several American citizens, were put in jail and with false charges. And he did everything he could to get them out. Uh, he, being a very famous man and having a lot of uh, uh, contacts. He talked to the, our government, the State Department. He tried everything he could for about four or five weeks to get his workers, because he was known for his faithfulness, his loyalty to his, his employees, and he couldn't get them out. Eventually, he hired a group of mercenary soldiers to go into Tehran and free them from prison and got them out of, out of Tehran. They even made a movie about this. I read the book, and one of the stories, part of the story was when they first started having the problem, the day that the information came to him that his men had been arrested, he was in Dallas, Texas, and he told his secretary, well, contact our office over there in Tehran. Now, we're talking about 40 years ago. Didn't have internet. Telephone service at that time was not like it is today, even. It was really hard, and of course, there was a revolution going on in Iran at that time. So the secretary tried. She, she tried dialing. She tried using an operator. It took us about four or five hours of effort on the part of that secretary to finally get a telephone call to their office over there in Tehran. They finally got it through, and he got on the phone and talked to the people that there in the office. They began to inform him what was going on, and he then made a decision. He said, because it took us so much and it was so hard to make this connection, I don't want you to hang up over there. I'm going to put somebody on the phone here, 
And I'll have someone, I want someone over there 24 hours, and we're going to keep this line open. We're not going to hang up, and we're going to keep the telephone going, the telephone call going. And they did that for three weeks. Now, the first thing we think about at that time is, at that time, a telephone call was several dollars a minute. So what was the, what was the, what was the bill? <laughs> but then I began to think. Scripture says we should pray without ceasing. What that really means is we need to have that telephone line with heaven open all the time. And he's sitting there waiting, waiting to me. If I just say something, Lord, he says, I'm right here, son. But what breaks down that communication? Our sin. And what reestablishes that line when we confess our sin to him. It reestablishes the relationship. So we have 24 hours. Every, we, don't have to worry, we don't have to dial it up. We don't have to worry about the payment. He, he covers the cost. All we have to do is say, Lord, and he's right there. Another thing about this confession of the prodigal son. He didn't get distracted. When he first got there, he probably was thinking, what's my father going to do? Is he mad at me? Is he going to reject me? You see, uh, he, and of course he's coming back home. He hasn't been back maybe for several years. And the joy of seeing places that are, he's familiar with. And then all of a sudden he sees his father coming, running joyously with the arms, arms out. And probably what I would have done was, Lord, that's a very uncomfortable thing to bring up right now on this joyous occasion. I'm going to wait to make my confession. But no, the first, things, first words out of his mouth was his confession. Whenever you get convicted and whenever you make a vow and you commit yourself to make confession, the devil is going to try to distract you. The devil is going to try to give you other reasons for not doing it. But if God has told you to get something right, don't wait. Get it done as soon as you can. And when you see that person that you must get it right with, the first things out of your mouth should be confession. Lastly, he didn't expect a reward for his confession. He didn't expect to be made son again. What did he ask? Make me as one of thy hired servants. I want to be at the bottom of the barrel. I want to be at the bottom of the ladder. I don't expect any reward. Just let me come home. Now, in his mercy, his father restored him. But he didn't deserve it. He realized he didn't deserve it. You know, sometimes we can do things that make us disqualified to serve the Lord. I'll be honest with you, it does happen. You can be limiting how much you can serve God by the sins in your life. Now, it doesn't mean you can't serve God. God still has a place for you. But don't get bitter about it. Be happy that God can still have a place for you for you no matter what it is. Don't demand that God restore you. If he does so, it's in his mercy, but you have no right to make any demands when you make confessions. I trust that as we've studied something like this, it might touch your heart. I hope you realize what confession really is. Now we could go on. There's a lot more examples. There's a lot of other things, but because of lack of time, I'm going to finish up here. But my prayer is that this will touch your heart to realize that confession is a very important part of your daily life as a Christian. And doing it right is important. Father, we thank you for the privilege we've had of being here this morning. I pray that you would use uh, your, word, your word and the examples that we've seen here to help us understand and to do confession properly before you and before others also. Thank you for the privilege we've had this morning of going through this. We pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you very much. I appreciate it.